my life was endangered. Uh, they tried to burn us alive. And they put the house on fire. Our house, they unscrewed tires in our pickup truck. They attacked me physically. They um, vandalized our church for three months. They put our um, um, school bus on fire, tried to burn our church down. Um, they broke into our church, stole our equipment. Uh, so we have been subjected to all of those things. Welcome to another episode of Encounters with God. I uh, have my good friend from Canada, Art Pulaski, back. Uh, as he is going to discuss many things going on in Canada, the Canadian government, uh, charges against him, and um, maybe even discuss uh, his son's uh, speech. Uh, well, welcome back, Art. Thank you so much for having me back. Well, man, I just want to start off where we get to talk about you. I I saw uh, Nathaniel's speech to the European Parliament. All I can say is, wow, what an anointed word he had for those people. Yes, yes. Um, I was invited to come and uh, testify uh, before the European Parliament, but I am on house arrest. As you know, I am um, apparently the most dangerous criminal in a country because as a pastor, I delivered a message to the truckers and farmers a year ago, telling them uh, to stand uh, for their God and state given rights, but do it peacefully. Well, three times during my 19 minute sermon, I told them peacefully, no guns, no swords, solidarity style, a way which was a peaceful revolution, non-compliance. And it was that speech they landed me 50 days in prison, solitary confinement, metal cages, psych ward, uh, max spot for the most dangerous terrorists. And of course, as you remember, the trial uh, happened and the Crown prosecutor accused me of uh, causing Canadian economy over $400 million worth of damages. He compared my peaceful sermon uh, on a private property to the truckers and farmers to Rwanda genocide. Stephen Johnston is his name, the Crown Prosecutor here in the province of Alberta from a special prosecutor's office. Stephen Johnston said that what I said was like a man inciting murder on other people, and he kept comparing it to Rwanda genocide. So uh, the guy is insane. This whole thing was a sham. It was a show trial. And um, uh, what happened was uh, he also uh, suggested that the Polish solidarity was some kind of, uh, somehow a violent coup. Um, anyway, a month later, I was found guilty by the judge of everything. I'm a, a convicted criminal. Um, I'm the first one ever to be found guilty on inciting mischief. I am the first one ever to be charged and now found guilty on eco-terrorism, interfering uh, with the crucial infrastructure under the Defense Act and the breach of release order. Guilty, guilty, guilty. The judge said everyone that took part of the Freedom Convoy is a criminal. We're all a bunch of criminals. It was uh, only over a million of us that took part in this. We we're all a bunch of criminals, according to this judge from Medicine Hat, Gordon Krinker. Krinke, Krinke um, from Medicine Hat. So anyway, uh, it is what it is. Um, I um, was scheduled to have a sentencing um, actually two days from now, um, August the 9th. And it was pushed again for over a month to September 18th. Believe it or not, I am still on house arrest. I think this has never been done uh, before. A pastor on house arrest for a sermon. Uh, but I am. Um, the witnesses, as you remember, were not called. It was um, the entirety of the trial was based on what I said, and uh, they were arguing between themselves what I meant when I said certain things. Um, so, sentencing is August is September the eighteenth. Um, during that time, I got invited to testify before the European Parliament. I couldn't go. I'm not allowed to leave my country. So therefore, I sent my wife and my son. They went over there and Nathaniel was able uh, to testify uh, before those people, the members of parliament. And it was absolutely amazing. I'll tell you the truth. When I was listening to his speech, I was actually crying. And um, 
and then I was able to talk to them via a video. And um, I was told by my wife that there was a standing ovation and people were crying and it was a very moving moment. It's very interesting because the very solidarity movement that the Crown Prosecutor attacked, uh, the solidarity movement in Poland that took down the communist dictatorship in Europe, the very movement that liberated Europe and uh, all over European Parliament, there are placards of solidarity. The Crown Prosecutor vilified Kenyan government, uh, said that this is some kind of an evil, violent coup that happened in, in Poland. So fast forward, uh, they came back and uh, upon arrival in uh, Montreal, Nathaniel was detained. Apparently, his uh, passport was flagged, and they were interrogated, searched by the customs with my wife. And later, Nathaniel learned that there is a warrant for his arrest in Calgary. So I activated all my friends. I started to talk to anyone I can about what is happening. I had to hire a lawyer. You know how it is. The process is the punishment. When they take you to the ringer, that's the punishment. We're yeah. talking about, we already spent over a million dollars. For me, now I had to hire another lawyer, $10,000 retainer, $525 per hour. So that's how they fight. They try to finish you off. If you dare to oppose them, they will go after you. They will go after your family. They will go after your job. They will go after your bank account. They will go after your money. They are the biggest mafia entity that I have ever seen. Uh, it's absolutely unbelievable. Uh, so Natanya was charged with two counts, illegally participating in a rally, a protest that the mayor, the psychopathic witch of the West, as we call her, Judy Gondek, the mayor of the city of Calgary, declared illegal. If you oppose what she agrees with, that's illegal and you will be charged. And it's one year attached to this. And he was also charged with harassment because during the protest, as you know, a lawful protest under the Criminal Code of Canada, uh, under our constitution, Charter Rights and Freedoms, um, a peaceful assembly, according to them is illegal. And he dared to read the Bible because he read the Bible, he was charged with harassment and already pleaded not guilty, and, and the trial is, is is moving ahead. So those are the tactics of the totalitarian regime, because don't kid yourself, we're no longer living in a free and democratic society. Canada has fallen. And uh, Nathaniel, during his speech in European Parliament, he compared uh, the Prime Minister Justin Trudeau Castro, as I call him, to a modern-day Caligula, because yeah. those are mad emperors, and, and he's so right on target. Those are mad people. They're they're completely insane. What they're doing to Canadians is uh, insanity at the highest levels. Uh, people are dropping dead left and right. They're murdering people. Coercion is still, uh, a, you know, life. And um, so, you know, what is going to happen? It's quite interesting. I don't think Canadians realize how dangerous this precedent has become if um, a pastor can be arrested, subjected to torture, kept in prison, stripped naked, solitary confinement, metal cages, max spot, you name it, then um, charged with inciting mischief. Well, like, what is inciting mischief? What, what is mischief? Is a made up stuff by the government and it's criminal and it has 10 years attached to it. So inciting mischief is, is technically speaking, a thought crime. If the government doesn't like what you say, they can go after you with that offense and they don't really have to prove anything. Uh, and that's exactly what happened in my case. There was no proof whatsoever. It was a made up charge, made up stuff, show trial. And then I was found guilty. I'm the first Canadian ever to be found guilty on inciting mischief. Um, the first one ever to be charged and now convicted of this eco-terrorism uh, interfering with the crucial infrastructure under the Defense Act. I, I mean, total insanity. So I think Canadians do not realize that if they can go after a pastor, you're next. Uh, a reporter can be charged with inciting because of what the reporter says that the government doesn't like. If you are a, an opposition politician, 
and you disagree with the ruling party, you can be charged with inciting uh, because the government, that's the way the government can remove you from political office, from political um, realm by attacking your thoughts, attacking your freedom of expression. Um, so that's what we're facing right now. It's quite unbelievable. And of course, they've pushed the sentencing again. Um, I think it's a it's a part of tactic to keep me under the house arrest, to keep me under the gun as long as they can, um, to subject me to this psychological and physical cruelty right now. I'm still on house arrest uh, to frustrate my ability to rally people, to 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 get the people, um, you know, physically in one place in order to oppose what the totalitarian government is doing. I think they're afraid of the solidarity movement. They know history. Majority of the Canadians do not know history. Unfortunately, they don't teach history in the schools anymore. They teach, you know, how to have a, a you know, uh, how to masturbate yourself or have a condom when you're six years old or how to be messed up. And if you feel like a kitty, that's okay. So that's what they teach children these days. They don't teach geography, mathematics, and history anymore. So Canadians do not know. Uh, but I think that solidarity movement, the villains know history and scare them to their deaths. They know that solidarity took down their attempt to enslave the whole world before, and now it has the potential to tackle them down today if we would come together in solidarity with each other and oppose this great evil. What What is the range of punishment that you've been found guilty of? Up to 10 years up to 10 years for that hmm. and it's not your first run in you I mean you if i remember correctly you lost your uh, tax status but what was it 2008 yeah 2008 the canadian government came and said because i speak negatively about abortion homosexuality and divorce i am not eligible to have a charitable tax status even though i feed thousands of people on the streets of calgary um, we started to work with the homeless people since 1999. That's what we do. We have street church and we feed the poor. And then, of course, we have a, a church in the building as well where we teach theology and, and history. So um, my uh, trouble with the Canadian government started when I started to ask politically incorrect questions. Um, where is the money going uh, to fight homelessness. Uh, Canadian Alberta's government at that time designated over $2 billion to fight homelessness. And you couldn't find the money. You couldn't see what's going on on the streets was a different story. So I started to ask questions. Uh, you've designated those hundreds of millions of dollars, but where is the money? Where is the money going to? I don't see the money being spent anywhere. We have more homeless, not less. So where is the money? And it was that that triggered police and the bylaws and the politicians and the mainstream media to jump uh, to our throats. I was arrested multiple times. I was charged with nonsense charges. I was told that giving free goods and services in Canada is illegal right now. <laughs> so if you give a, a sandwich to a dying child on the streets, you just committed a crime. Um, I was told that congregating is against the law. Um, I was told that I have offensive signage. Uh, while I had banners that said, Jesus loves you, Jesus is king. According to them, that was offensive. And I got tens of thousands of dollars mm -hmm. worth of tickets for those offensive mm -hmm. signs. I was also told that um, um, a distribution of Bibles and gospel tracts is also prohibited by law, uh, giving printed material without a permit. Um, my Bibles were confiscated by the police and never given back to me. We had a raid of police and the bylaws. They came, took all of our Bibles away, gospel tracts, never gave them back. So we were subjected to this for a very long time. I did my best to warn Canadians, to tell them what's happening. Uh, I, I guess unsuccessfully, because at that time I was considered uh, too radical. I was uh, uh, preaching on the streets highly visible. Therefore, I was looking for trouble, according to them. While the trouble came and found them, even though they were hiding in their homes, as you remember, they were not allowed to have anyone in their homes. They were not allowed to leave their homes. Um, I warned them. 
about what's coming. And now I think more and more people realize that what I was saying was the truth, that we are being subjected to um, a communist, socialist, fascist hybrid that is trying to control every aspect of our lives. So 2006, I was arrested for public reading Bible. I uh, became the first Canadian ever to be arrested for that crime, faced a year of imprisonment, mm -hmm. won that. But 2015, finally, I win my last trial. I had over 100 trials. At that time, 11 arrests and uh, over 100 court cases. And um, I won the court of appeal. They left me alone. A few years later, the big lies showed up and they uh, started to attack us. Without mercy again, over 40 COVID citations, five arrests, and about 20 court cases. And I've won them all, including the Court of Appeal. Um, but I've lost this one. And uh, immediately after the sentencing, we're going to appeal it um, as well. So the fight will continue. We're not quitting. We're not stopping. We still feed thousands of people on the streets of Calgary without taxpayers' dime. And we also, three times a week, meet in a building where we teach and worship our God and and it's uh, it's insane during that time I don't know if you know um my life was endangered uh, they tried to burn us alive they put the house on fire our house they unscrewed tires in our pickup truck they attacked me physically they um, vandalized our church for three months they put our um, um, school bus on fire tried to burn the church down um, they broke into our church, stole our equipment. Uh, so we have been subjected to all of those things. Of course, vilified in the media uh, pretty much every day. Uh, they would call us super spreaders, murderers, um, white supremacists, uh, racist, haters, you name it, homophobes, transphobes. Um, so whatever they have at their disposal to uh, vilify us so we can be subjected to more vandalism. That's what the media were was trying to do. Uh, the media were doing everything in their power so the people would attack us. And that's exactly what happened. Our cars were vandalized. Uh, people were um, attacking us physically because according to, to the mainstream media, we were the ones murdering people. So we were the bad people. Um, and and that's that just how, how it went in the mainstream media and the politicians. Uh, believe it or not, we do not have one politician, not even one, not a single one MLA or member of parliament or a senator that defends us. Not a single Canadian politician is defending our rights. Zero, not one. The COVID mm -hmm. era came and, and, and went, and according to them, there is nothing to hear, uh, to see here. Let's just move on, pretend that that, that, that never happened. Um, we have one party right now. We don't have other parties. There's only one ruling party without, uh, with different colors. So we've got the liberals. I call them the Nazis because they are the federally ruling party that murders people left and right. Uh, then we have the NDP party, which are communists and socialists, and they're not even hiding it. And that's the most bizarre thing. They are not hiding their true colors. And then we've got sold outs traitors the so-called conservatives and um it's, it's fascinating because it was the conservative party in number of provinces that did this to us it was not the liberals or the ndpers it was the conservatives that did this to us in ontario alberta and other places um we uh, had more arrests if it comes to the clergy than any other part of canada i mean we arrested more people here in Canada during the slide and the Chinese government, you know, we arrested more pastors than the North Koreans. It's, it's crazy, crazy stuff. Um, so the tyranny continues. They're not stopping. Um, uh, we have about 3000 different, still different individuals in the province of Alberta that are being subjected to the COVID lie and the tyranny. Uh, people lost businesses, uh, people lost churches, um, bank accounts were frozen, and of course, they're making an example out of me for daring to give a message of hope to a desperately broken Canadians 
that were uh, betrayed by their own representatives. Now, the the pastors in your area art are they um, are they backing you up? Are they supportive of you? Uh, the pastors in the churches there. Uh, no, majority of the pastors actually got the money from the government during the slide. So 99% of the churches got the money, some millions of dollars. Uh, they segregated people, they separated people, uh, they put security outside, um, uh, checking if people have the Nazi passport. Uh, many of them turned their facilities into a COVID clinics, believe it or not. So you could go to a church. You couldn't go to a church to worship. You could go to a church to get a job, an experimental drug uh, that we were warning people about. And of course, now the conspiracy theory has been proven once again that it was not a conspiracy at all. It was actually the truth. Uh, we have people dying suddenly nonstop. Uh, sure, famous sure. people are dropping dead. Um, young people are dropping dead. Uh, there is um, all kinds of um, uh, reactions that people face after they took, especially the boosters were uh, the big problem here in Canada. So, um, and no, the answer is no, because we have three categories of people in our churches um, outside of a small remnant. We have Ezavs that sold Jesus for a bowl of soup, for comfort, me, I, and myself. We've got Judas Iscariots that sold Jesus for a silver coin, money. And then we've got Peters, cowards, that denied, denied Jesus, denied their faith, and did everything the government was telling them to do because of fear. They were terrorized, afraid, and they just went along. Um, so it's very hard for those people. I mean, the first two categories of people that are lost, there's nothing, they're not going to, to live. There's nothing to do with them. Uh, they're beyond redemption. They're going to face hell. Uh, but then you've got Peters, and it's very hard for Peters in the 21st century uh, to acknowledge I'm a coward and I sold my faith and my Jesus because mm -hmm. I was afraid. Um, so there is this um, an advocate sitting here chirping well you did it to save lives you did it to protect the church you did it because otherwise there will be arrest so uh, by doing this by obeying the nazi party uh, you uh, were saving lives and protecting people of course it's a lie uh, but people are amazing at lying especially to each other and to themselves so um it's a sad statement but out of the ashes i out of this tragedy uh, people are rising up. There's more and more, I call them faceless, nameless nobodies in the eyes of men. Uh, people that you look at them, it's like, seriously? You know, before you would say nothing good can come out of this. And yet they're becoming the modern day heroes, the Esthers, the Mordecais, the Joshua's, the Caleb's, you know, the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Uh, the remnant is rising up. And that's a beautiful thing to see, I'm telling you. It's absolutely amazing to see those men and women uh, being so brave and uh, without compromise. They're unapologetics. Uh, uh, you know, they, they're, they just do not apologize. They they do what God calls them to do. And that's a beautiful thing to see. Hmm. And you had a, a visit from a very uh, famous uh, evangelist minister, Franklin Graham. Yeah, so... Um, Franklin Graham um, contacted me and he says um, that he's in Calgary. He would like to, to meet uh, us, so um, to thank me. According to Franklin Graham, I am his hero. And he said, if every pastor did what I did, uh, this world would look completely different. And it was very humbling. It was very amazing to see because to me, he's one of the generals in the faith and I know he has been heavily criticized for some of his mistakes. I mean, but who does not make mistakes? We all make mistakes. Um, he believed in something and he went along. Uh, but that was a very amazing meeting. I took my wife and my son as well because uh, they wanted to meet him. Uh, we spent about an hour chatting, talking, and uh, yeah. it was it was quite amazing to sit with this man. Of course, um, I know his father. I uh, listened to his father. 
His father came to Poland when I was just a kid to fight for Polish people and and so David uh, Wilkerson as well. So those, to me, those are the the generals in a fate and the fruit of their labor was a revival in Poland and people like us came to fate because there were some Americans willing to go behind the Iron Curtain and pray and, and preach the truth. Uh, so it was amazing to hear that to him, you know, I am his hero and and he thanked me for what I did. Actually, he sent me a letter um, and a few pictures of that of that meeting as a thank you as well. Um, so it was it was nice that they are leaders in our community, a big leaders that understand what is happening, and they acknowledge, you know, publicly what is happening, and they're not ashamed of uh, of standing with those that are fighting standing with those that are, are preaching the truth. Because in the end of the day, we got to remember, it is not our wishful intentions. It's not even feeding the thousands of people that we feed. The Bible says that the truth will set the captives free. The whole fight is about the truth. Did God really say that? From the very beginning to the very end, we are fighting for that truth. Hmm. Yeah. Well, you're one of my heroes too, Art. Thank you. Yeah. So something that I've noticed in Canada that's totally uh, mind-boggling to me is the fact that how Christians are treated versus Muslims. I was just reading that over the LGBTQ, so forth, the alphabet mafia, in the school districts there, that the Muslims are now planning a million-person protest, a million. And, I, and I've said this all along, that they, they're not going to tolerate having their children being sexually indoctrinated um, when they have such a strong belief about homosexuality. And I, I see two two different ways you're a Christian being treated this way and the Muslims. I don't think they're going to go after the Muslims. Uh, well, they started to go after them as well. Uh, they they have. Okay. Start Yes, in Canada, they started to indoctrinate their children. That's why there is an yes. uprising. Right. In a community. Um, I just had a meeting two weeks ago with a, a Muslim leader. He wanted to meet with me, and um, he was charged criminally. So wow. they charged him criminally for organizing rallies in Calgary. Hmm. So he stopped organizing them. I think they they effectively scared him at this moment. But Ontario is rising up, and he has the Imams over there, uh, they want to bring a million people yes. to oppose the grooming of the children, to oppose pedophilia and uh, in, the, in, in the sick, perverted indoctrination in the school. So we'll see how that unfolds. I'm sure the, that scares them because Muslims are not as pathetic as Christians. Um, pretty much now you can walk on Christian and he will uh, thank you for it. Uh, you can't do that to the Muslims. They will rise up and they will punch you. They will fight. They are warriors. And so it's going to be fascinating to see how everything unfolds. As you know, Nathaniel was uh, charged with an offense for attending a, a protest and for reading the Bible. So they charged him without hesitation. I had to hire a, a lawyer uh, and... Uh, and the fight continues. So uh, it's going to see, you know, it's going to be interesting to see what they're going to do with such a masses when those masses are going to rise up. I'm sure they're going to try to cook something up. Um, but anyway, I'm looking at this and I'm marveling because the question comes, where are the pastors? Where are the Christians? Yes. Uh, why there's such a huge apathy within the church, that the churches are not interested in standing up, not even for their children. Instead, they just love to do entertainment and uh, a kumbaya meetings instead of being relevant in our society. It's it's kind of beyond me to understand because everything in the Bible is screaming that you must do something. Talk is cheap. Jesus said, listen to what they say, but do not do what they do. It's about deeds. It's about doing. It's be, it's about being relevant in a society. And of course, the church is completely irrelevant 
That's why the government uh, called the church unessential services, uh, because they truly evaluated the church as nothing. It means nothing to you, Christians, therefore it means nothing to us. And somehow the church went along, and, yeah, yeah, you're right. It means nothing to you, it means nothing to us. It's all a business, it's an entertainment. And you know, you're not willing, you will not be willing to die for entertainment. I mean, how many people are going to die uh, for a movie, to watch a movie, right? How many people are willing to die for, you know, going and listening to some musician play? Uh, and no one. So that's why those pastors, those Christians were not willing to pay the price for entertainment, because that's what it is. It was just an entertainment and uh, no one was willing to pay the price for entertainment. If they were real Christians, if those pastors were real God shepherds, not just hired guns for money, um, they would be like the prophets, apostles of old. They would stand up and they would say, no, you want to arrest me, arrest me. You want to kill me, kill me. But I'm not allowing you to do this after my dead body. And it would be over for the villains. I mean, if the church alone would stand up, it would be over, but they didn't. They sold Jesus for a bowl of soup or a silver coin, or they were just plain cowards, terrified, afraid of a, either a small pathogen or the restrictions, the consequences of not obeying a tyrannical, evil, wicked, uh, wannabe pharaoh uh, government. It's very sad to see all this unfolding, and particularly, I mean, this is in Canada. We're not talking about communist China. This is in Canada. And to see this happening, uh, you know, it reminds me of a, a Dietrich Bonhoeffer when he was trying to stir the pastors up with about Hitler and Nazi Germany. And you know, he, he couldn't arouse the pastors. The church was silent. They actually went along with him. They had a chance to to turn the tide, but they didn't. Actually, uh, it's worse than that. They were not only silenced, silenced during the greatest opportunity that God wanted them to sign. They were participants of evil. Mm -hmm. A majority of the churches were flying swastikas outside just yeah. so the government would leave them alone. Uh, the government would not uh, oppose the Nazi party. They were complicit. They were part of that uprising of evil. So not only they allowed it, they took part. That's why their sin is a lot worse, a lot bigger than just, I see nothing, I hear nothing, I'll say nothing. They actively participated in this craziness in the 30s, 20s and 30s in Germany. Yeah, well, that's like churches today. You see uh, they're flying the pride flag or they're flying the BLM flag. And uh, it's very disturbing to see that. They've just uh, uh, parroted what the culture is, is saying to them. And instead of being against the culture or standing for biblical truth, they're just following what the crowd is doing. Yeah, absolutely. It is a tragedy. I said, we have been given the greatest opportunity ever mm -hmm. to shine for Jesus. And look, we're yeah, a bunch yeah. of corrupted, sold out, cowards, Judas's, Iscariots, and Ezabs. Um, Instead of being like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, or like Daniel, Esther, Deborah, Joshua, Caleb, we have, uh, we have become useless completely hypocritical in our faith. You know, when you listen to those fancy preachers talking about faith, you just want to puke because in the past three years, they show that they have no faith whatsoever. It's a charade. It's a joke. It's a lie. It's a business. They're telling people what they, people want to hear, but because of money, it's like a, a clown that entertains people and is juggling. And he's getting money for that job. So that's the churches now. They're just getting, they're being paid for a certain job. And they come, they do their job. They don't mean what they say. They don't believe what they preach, but it pays well. Therefore, they're continuing doing this because it's a job. It's like a clerk that goes to a store. I'm sure that clerk working for Walmart is not in, you know, in love with Walmart. I, I bet they don't know personally the owner. They're just doing their job, you know, whatever. It's a paycheck. And that's what uh, pastors do these days. It's just a paycheck. Hmm. 
Yeah. Or do you think Canada is kind of like, uh, I think about the prophet Jeremiah, you know, he's telling, warning the people of judgment. Is, is, is there, um, is there hope for Canada? Uh, what's, uh, what's your opinion on that? Well, um, it, it, craziness ends when we say it ends. The moment you invite God back into your land, back into your political system, educational system, all the mountains of influence, when you bring God back to your life, to your society, to your family, uh, when he shows up, he comes with liberty. He comes with freedom. And I said that so many times, especially to Americans, uh, that if you want your liberties, you must bring God of liberty. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. There is freedom. So uh, is there hope? There's always hope. People can always rise up. Or people can always turn away from their wicked ways and cry out to God and say, Jesus, come and, and forgive us. Wash us with your blood. Um, are they going to do that? Well, here's an interesting thing. I truly believe that we're in the middle of judgment as we speak right now. We are in the middle of God's judgment. Um, the judgment starts in the house of God. God has been judging us. He has been waiting us and we have been found wanting. So after the judgment, unless the church repents, unless the people come back to God and start obeying his commandments, after the judgment, I believe the wrath of God is going to come. And um, I truly believe that Canada is heading for a Great Depression. I believe Canadians are going to lose their homes, uh, many of them. I believe that Canadians are going to lose their toys, their vacations, their restaurants. I believe that there is great hardship that we're about to witness in Canada for their arrogance, greed, and um, and them are not being interested in the kingdom of God whatsoever. They, they are not interested in uh, everything that God stands for. Um, so what I'm trying to say is I believe that God will have his final say. I believe that there is going to be a great revival in the land, but they will come through the fire, through difficulties, through hardship. I believe that, that, that the Canadians are going to be taken through the grind there and they're going to be hurting and out of that hurt, some will come back to God and some will cry out to God. Um, I don't see, unfortunately, I don't see any other way. Um, we're living in a very evil society. Canadians are bloody murderers. They love to murder their children. And they're not murdering their children because of something big and huge. They're murdering their children in the name of convenience. Um, we are parading our sin a million people in Toronto is coming to watch perverts stripping themselves naked on the streets of Toronto. And somehow that's pride parade and it's acceptable and it's good. It's beautiful. Um, we are um, parading our sin and perversion, uh, grooming of the children, drag queen story hours, pedophilia, left and right. Um, Canadians have become very self-centered, arrogant, selfish greedy and, and and i'm telling you i just don't see the society coming back to god without hardship i'm observing political realm and the bigger the liar you are the most vile liar and pervert you are the more votes you get the more people are following you you look at the twitter the psychopath prime minister uh, castro uh, the caligula of today he has, uh, what, a million people following him. Like, what are you following? Perversion? What are you following? The, the, no one should even spit at that direction. Uh, yeah. But every vile human being that is there is being followed and cherished and people are commenting, I love you, you're the best, you're this, I love your hair. It, it's a total insanity. It's It's kind of an unfolding of Romans 1 in front of our eyes. We don't want to retain the knowledge of God. We don't want to submit to God's word and God in turn. Uh, we have free will uh, as a result of our decision. God gives God gives us over to our uh, sinful desires and our reprobate mind. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so I remember years ago, he said to me, uh, they have rejected my mercy, love and grace. But I will have my revival, but it will come through the fire. 
Mm. When he said that to me, I immediately knew difficult times are coming for Canadians. Um, I believe that the God will have his final say, but I believe that people will hurt before that happens. And they're already hurting. I mean, don't kid yourself. We are in the middle of judgment as we speak. Uh, people are dropping dead left and right. Um, uh, you know, pretty much all the time we hear about sudden deaths and uh, adverse reactions to the experimental drug. Um, so there's a lot of people hurting, losing their jobs or not being able to work because of that, um, losing their loved ones. So uh, lots of people are hurting. I don't know if they fully understand what is the remedy. If they would only turn their hearts to God, God would come back and heal their land. I don't think they are there yet. I think because of indoctrination and selfishness, they think they are gods and they are in control of their lives and they can do whatever they want. Uh, the moment they uh, will realize that they're not gods and they're not control, in, in control, maybe they will cry out to God. And when they will cry out to God, he will come. He will come. He's a merciful, amazing God. He's a loving God. He's a just God. He's a holy God. And he will come and he will um, come to the rescue because that's his character. He's, he's an amazing God, but he's not going to force himself. If you're kicking and screaming, I don't want your help. Fine. You're kicking and screaming. You don't want my help. Fine. It's okay. Have it your way. Enjoy your right. Fix your problems yourself. But when you are sick and tired of trying, then uh, know that I am here and I'm willing to help you. And I have the means and the power to do so. Well, you've lived through this uh, in Poland. Now you're experiencing this in Canada. What word do you have to Americans who seem to be uh, just very lethargic about any of these issues? They don't want to know. Don't tell me about this. Uh, do you have a word for us? Well, I'll say uh, with the words of my brother, Americans wake up and smell coffee while you still have coffee because they're coming after your coffee. And um, it's fascinating to see that there are no lineups um, uh, of people. And uh, during the pandemic as well, there were no lineups uh, to churches, uh, but they were lineups to coffee shops. And somehow mm -hmm. you were perfectly protected when you were standing for a coffee, uh, but it would be a disaster if you were standing and worshiping God. So, um, quite often I said to Americans, you think you have protection because of your declaration of independence and the, and the constitution and the amendments, but the villains, the tyrants of today, the wannabe pharaohs, they don't care about your human rights. They don't care about your piece of paper. You must care about your piece of paper. And if you will not, it's not about you anymore. They're coming after your children. So if you're not willing to stand up and fight, you must hate your children. Because they're going to live in hell because of you, not because of the villains. The villains are always here and they'll always be here. It's up to us, the people, to say no to the villains. And if we choose not to say that, then we are as guilty as the villains. And the consequences are not just for us. The consequences are for our children as well and their children. What kind of a nation are we willing to leave behind is up to us. So in a way... Um, Today is the day of salvation. Today we can do something. And if you choose not to because of your selfish reasons, the shame on you and the consequences you will pay eventually and your children. Um, it's time for the great American re uh, eagle to rise up once again. You've done it before. There is that need again. Start moving and start flapping your wings uh, because for such a time as this, God has you know, place us in this timeline, historical timeline. We must do what's required of us today or the enemy will win. We cannot allow that. Hmm. Well, Art, I uh, appreciate your time. What what can we do to help you? Well, um, I, actually, it's quite simple, believe it or not. Uh, we need uh, prayers. We need, if you can, Put political pressure 
on Canadian government, how you do that by talking to your representatives so they can put political pressure on our representatives. Uh, Canadian politicians are extremely weak, cowardly. Uh, they are snowflakes. And when American politicians are talking about them, they don't like that. They are shaken. Um, Canadian politicians are doing all of this evil in the shadows, like cockroaches spreading their diseases. So what we do, bring the light, shine a light on them. And like cockroaches, they run uh, hiding. Uh, so spread the word around, talk to the politicians so they can put pressure on political uh, representatives here. Call the Premier, Daniel Smith, about this issue. Voice your dissatisfaction with the Minister of Justice here in Alberta. Tell them what you think about this. And of course, the never-ending problem that we always face, uh, lawyers. I mean, surviving this ordeal, the process is the punishment. Hiring lawyers, $10,000 retainer, $525 per hour. I mean, who can afford that? I can't. I don't know if you can. Unless you're a millionaire or billionaire, you cannot afford to fight them. That's why we're crowdfunding. That's why we are talking to others. If you can chip in, please do. You know, like my brother David says, we're willing to fight, but please supply the bullets. We're willing to shoot or we'll keep shooting or we'll keep shooting the, the truth. But without the bullets, we can't do that. If we go down, especially if we go down financially, that's a tragedy. So you can help us there. Everyone can give something. Everyone can chip in. Uh, go to streetchurch.ca, street like a road, streetchurch.ca. And there are all kinds of ways uh, that you can support the ministry. Uh, you can use your credit cards. There's PayPal there. There's all kinds of ways that you can support us. And, and please do if you can, uh, because how else can we survive this unbelievable, enormous attack of a well-equipped army, the Philistines, the Philistine army that has all the weapons and uh, big giants without the support of fellow humans that value what we do, there's no way we can survive this. So if you're willing to help, help spread the word around Pray for us. And know this, that in the end, we know how the story ends. Make sure you're on the right side of history. You are. Make sure you're on the right side of the fence because we know how the story ends. We win in the end. God wins in the end. We just have to go through it, through this valley. But God walks there with us. So be a good person. Be on the right side of, of history. Be in a good standing with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and the judge of judges will judge us all. And we will pay for everything we did or for everything we didn't do. And we were supposed to do. Um, so be blessed. Thank you so much for supporting, listening and keeping us in your prayers. Well, thanks so much. Howard. I appreciate you, man. You are truly an inspiration, a man of God. That's not a share to the shame of the gospel, like other people, pastors uh and so we will uh continue to be in touch with you and hopefully we can uh talk again in another month or two uh and you won't uh you'll come through this victorious amen we have already won the enemy amen. just but yet so uh you have to have that kind of a mindset god has uh, covers our back he has our back he is ultimately the King of Kings and the Lord of uh, Lord of uh, Lords, and our lives do not belong to the crown, to the judge, or to the politician. Our lives belong to the living God, and I, like I said so many times, He will have the final say. What happens to us 